Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Frailty. It's a descriptor we apply to a textbook stereotype of a person in old age. But it doesn't have to be. What is frailty? What are the early warning signs? And when symptoms arise, how do you combat it? And hey, doesn't frailty only apply to those who can hardly go for a walk down their own hallway? Grace Park, a key organizer in the CARES program, says no. Grace is part of a movement to engage seniors to combat frailty, and she encourages people to start early. She and her team are working on a program that aids in the prevention of frailty, helps people recognize early symptoms, and adapt to life around frailty. They do this through exercise, proper eating, and most importantly, community accountability. From weekly check-ins with volunteers to exercise classes to clubs that encourage friendships, Grace and her group at CARES program are urging people to remain active through their local community. To talk about frailty, the importance of remaining active, and why frailty prevention programs are needed throughout Canada, we sat down with Grace Park for a conversation that matters. Dr. Grace Park, welcome. Thank you. There's a whole bunch of us that are in that baby boomer generation. Yes. And we're aging. And a lot of us are not aging well. You know, you can think about internal organs and so on, but you have now been spearheading a project around frailty. How big of an issue is aging and becoming frail, and why is it something that we need to guard against? I think aging and frailty progression is the topic that we all must take a good look at. And as a family physician, I have a lot of patients in our demographic, you and I as well. We're in the baby boom demographic, and as we get older, um, we have people ahead of us that have shown us that maybe their lifestyle wasn't the best. And so we need to encourage better lifestyles, and not just lifestyle and education about it, but really support people to be able to take on that lifestyle and make it a habit for themselves. So what are the elements of a lifestyle that don't necessarily allow us to move into the later part of the sixth, seventh, and eighth generations of our lives. Like, what are some of those things that we said, uh, now that we have some experience with this, we need to be aware of it, and then let's talk about after that what we need to do to have a much healthier outcome. Mm -hmm. So I emphasize three domains with my patients and areas that we know that if we're really good at encouraging, um, it will reduce the risk of patients developing frailty as they get older. And that's physical activity, regular exercise, good nutrition, and lots of socialization. So within each of those domains, we actually talk about a wellness plan. And so socialization, if you're involved in church groups or have very active uh, social network that's really helpful um, with good nutrition ensuring that you have good food security you're able to get good food and think about getting your basic foods in and then also the exercise and turning that into a regular part of your life and that is not something that everybody can do so uh, clearly there are people who haven't lived the healthiest life what is the outcomes that we're starting to see and that we can learn from that, uh, th that is the result of not being so robust, not being socialized, not having the, the, the proper diet? So we are seeing a lot of people now in the age of late 70s, 80s that have become frail because they have not made an active lifestyle their habit. Um, perhaps they haven't developed a social network that's so helpful in preventing um, the dependence, which is really a marker for frailty as well. So we're learning from that population and also there's a lot more education and information available for those that are coming up to that age. And so we're working with that pre-frail group of patients in this project to uh, ensure they get into a lifestyle and a habit of ensuring they have good exercise and nutrition and socialization in their lives. So a little point of clarification, what exactly is frailty? How do we define it? 
So frailty can be defined in multiple different ways and different people um, have developed ways of measuring frailty as well and it's in the literature. So you have uh, ways of measuring physical frailty. So a person uh, unexplained weight loss, fatigue, slowed gait speed, uh, decreased strength in general decreased activity so that would be a physical sort of manifestation of frailty but we do think that it's sort of uh, more than that is a social aspect psychosocial aspect as well as the medical aspects in a person's health that determine frailty so we look at a person's um, cognition their memory um, whether they've started lapsing in their ability to recall things um, their risk of falls if they're actually falling their functional status if they really need somebody to help them with their activities of daily living or if they're dependent on others and other things like instrumental activities of daily living like doing their banking and shopping that kind of thing so all of those things we can measure and and look at an accumulated score that tells us how frail they are and this this is quite a sharp way of looking at a person's function and that determines whether they are in a frailty state Wow, it's fairly complex when I asked the question I thought okay you're gonna talk about muscle mass uh, bone strength but it, it weaves into every aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. So what role does the physician play then in being able to do that? Because traditionally we go, well, my elbow hurts or, you know, I'm, my, you know, I'm losing my bum. My mm -hmm. muscles are disappearing. What do I do? But what you're saying is, no, you're integrating into a, a much broader part of their lives. Yes, and that's <laughs> thanks to the research that's been done on frailty over the last number of years. And family physicians watch their patients get older. And up till now, it, we've been fairly helpless in determining you know, proactively whether a person is going to develop frailty. We can watch them lose their muscle mass, and that is a hallmark of frailty, sarcopenia. Um, you can lose, you can watch them as they lose their cognitive function and they're starting to get forgetful and family members are mentioning that. But now we actually have tools that we can actually deploy at the time of interviewing patients and families to say, okay, your frailty index is this, your frailty score is this, and this actually can predict your lifespan from here. This can actually predict how you're going to do after a surgery, and it can actually predict what kind of health care you're going to need. So we better start thinking about those things or end of life planning so it can get quite complex so is it too late by then because I know that you're you're now focusing on pre frailty is by the time that you're diagnosed as being frail can you turn that around or you know it's kind of like I'm sorry that's the path that you're on so frailty is a bit of a spectrum you can be mildly frail moderately or you can be severely frail as long as you're in the vulnerable mild stage there's still room to reverse that and our program is showing that if you take on an active lifestyle that in six months if you've turned that into a habit you can actually reverse some of that frailty progression so that's the exciting part that family physicians can be part of mm -hmm. um, once you're into the extremely severely frail it's pretty difficult because by then you're depending on others for self-care you've lost a lot of muscle mass you've really lost your ability to function and pretty soon you are going to be in need of nursing support, care facilities, and you will do poorly if you develop an illness. And life isn't too much fun when you're at that stage. Not is fun it? at all. Yeah. So tell, tell me how does the uh, frailty program work, especially if you're in that pre-failed failed program. Let's say I want to get involved. What do I do and then where do we go from there? So we're just starting this project in the Fraser Valley. Uh, we've done a pilot study with a group of family physicians that were willing to take on this extra work because it is extra work to go through the frailty assessment that I described earlier with their patients who they've chosen because they felt that they were in that pre-frail state but maybe bordering on that vulnerable situation. So we give them a frailty score on a sort of a scale of one to seven. And if they're fairly early in that progression, we enroll them in this program. And once they've done a comprehensive assessment, then we give them a frailty index. And in, after that, we enroll them into an exercise or socialization program with a coaching model with using the BC self-management coaching program that's mm -hmm. available to anybody in BC. And once a week, that senior gets a phone call to help them to stay motivated, to be accountable to the wellness plan that they've agreed on with their family doctor, 
and then they can actually report back to their family doctor if they have issues, barriers in, able to, in being able to enact that wellness plan. So it's really helping with the motivation mm -hmm. and building that accountability. And after the six months, we've shown that it improves their status, their frailty score improves, and then it takes six months really to turn it into a habit. And so I have patients that have, have gone through this program a couple of years ago now. Their scores improved after the six months. And even two years later, they know when they talk to me that they have to tell me what they're doing for exercise. How do I measure whether or not I'm pretty fair, frail? Like I look at myself. I am 61 years of age. So I would go, yeah, by virtue of age, do I sort of fall into that category? Because I don't feel like I'm, I'm there. No. Uh, and so it, it would be hard for me to admit that I'm entering that period of my life where I need that kind of encouragement. So how does somebody assess their own uh, well-being and say, okay, I better take action now? So this is the time to take action, and you and I are lucky. We're in the tail end of the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. And so we have some time to really work at this. And you have to train so that you're a better 70-year-old, better 80-year-old. And uh, if you can do this, um, getting a biological age is more important than your chronological age. So how do you do that? How so do you, you get... can talk to your family physician, mm -hmm. somebody who's known you for a long time, who will see you through over the next number of years, and talk about getting an assessment to see where you are in terms of frailty status. And I don't think your doctor at this point, Stu, would say, okay, let's do a frailty test on you because mm -hmm. they can look at you and say you really don't need that. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you can do for yourself is measure your gait speed because that has been correlated with Measure your gait, gait speed. speed. What does that mean? So time yourself as you walk five meters or 10 meters. If you take longer than, say, um, if you walk slower than 0.8 to 1 meter per second and you can't do it any faster for a sustained period of time, you're starting to slow down. And that's showing that you have weakness in your muscles. And that slowing down of gait is an indicator that you are starting to develop this weakness, the sarcopenia, that is a hallmark of frailty. So just slowing down would be a good indication. Mm -hmm. Now, people have accused me of being a slow walker my entire life. Well, you better pick it up, Stuart. <laughs> well, oh, oh, yeah. You can pick it up, and I say this to my husband as I go for a walk with him, the gait speed, we've got to pick it up, and you just have to move it. And is he listening? Not much right now, no. but I'm just his wife, not his doctor. <laughs> yeah, but you have insight into how all of this works. So. I, I'm sure that people will listen to this and go, hold it, just a second, all this uh, that I hear about training and exercise and active lifestyle, well, how active, how intense does that exercise have to be? And are there benefits at moderate exercise? Are they better at you know, a little more intense? And let's say you say, I'm really going to get into this. I'm going to fight this whole aging thing and push myself. Is that good or does it, you know, bring up possibility for other injuries that yeah. might say, you know, okay, you got to find the right range. So it depends on where you're at, and you can certainly talk to your healthcare provider about what kind of exercise, how hard to push yourself, depending on all your other medical conditions. Um, but it doesn't take a lot. Mild to moderate is good enough. If you can do 30 minutes three times a week, that's a really good place to start. Of what, though? Are we talking about Walking, just, yeah. walking, and being brisk at walking. If you can pick it up, that'd be really great. Um, anything you can do to increase your activity is great. So in our project, depending on the frailty status of our patient that's enrolled, uh, the coach will work with them as to what they're able to do. Mm -hmm. If there are patients that are living in condos and they can only walk with a walker, maybe just standing up from their chair from a seated position to standing five times is good enough for the first week to try and reach. If they can do that, then maybe the second week they can try and do that twice a week, two sets a day, I mean. Mm -hmm. So two sets a day. So then maybe get on to walking out in the hallway in the condo mm -hmm. once, a, once a day. So anything that you can do is better than sitting and not doing it. And then if you are more active and if you're a tennis player and you're still young and able to, Ensuring that you can maintain that is really important. So ensuring that you don't, you don't just go out on a weekend and play all out, but work during the week to keep your muscles strong so that you are flexible and strong and you're less likely to injure yourself when you do go out to play. So all of these things is a conversation with your healthcare provider. 
So what about weightlifting? And I'll, I tell you because we had Dr. Gifford Jones who wrote his book, uh, 90 Plus and How I Got Here. He says a little bit of light resistant weight training, you know, two or three times a day is he thinks is fundamental. And Dr. Max Snatter from the Brain Research Center says uh, light resistant weight training is not only good for your body, it's great for your brain. So does weight, is weight training something that we should all look at like not to build muscles, but because of all the other health benefits that absolutely, come with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I talk to my little old ladies, you can take a yeah. soup can in each hand. Yeah. A Campbell soup can is not heavy, and you can do some bicep curls, mm -hmm. or you can lift it up over your shoulder if you're able to. So weight training is really important, maintaining muscle mass, and if you can build muscle mass before you start losing it, better, because you're starting off with a better baseline. And another author that I really enjoyed was uh, Dr. Sherwin Newland, who wrote The Art of Aging, and he spoke about weight training as well as being the most important uh, exercise to do as you get older. Is that because it's good for your bones and your muscles? Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. So weight training does help to strengthen your bones as well. So this is a, I, something that I'm sure that anybody over 60 who starts to experience the loss of muscle mass, can you rebuild it? When like you, after your, after 60, can you rebuild you can, muscle? You can, absolutely, yes. Those cells need to be worked to be able to strengthen and grow those muscle cells. Mm -hmm. And so if you work them and do resistance training, you can definitely build their muscle. But we know that there's a depletion in the amount of testosterone that our body would produce, which is key to being able to build new muscle. It, do I have that right? Um, and without the same level of testosterone, am I still able to generate new muscle? I think as you get older, it's not so much a matter of testosterone, but use yeah. and functional use. And so weight training is one thing, but actually doing things like working in the garden, lifting boxes, the functional use is what's so important as you get older. So the minute you stop doing all of those things because you just can't be bothered, that's where you get the decline. And if you want to dedicate yourself because you haven't gotten anywhere near that and you want to build your muscle strength, you still are able to. So the biggest problem I have is like what I put in my mouth. And that, you know, when we talk about diet is fundamental. Are there two or three things that you say, look, you just got to stay away from them because they're not going to be good as you age. And yes. these are the things that you actually have to eat. Certainly, and we really rely on our nutritionists to give us those guidelines. Canada Food Guide is really important. You know, when I show them the plate, it, half of that has to be fruits and vegetables, quarter of that maybe your carbs and grains, and quarter of that for your protein. And so if you can stick to that at your main meals, then you're going to do better and count the fruits and vegetables in a day. Try and get at least five. If you can get ten, that's great. So those are sort of common basic things that mm -hmm. we try and remember. But if you need help because you're really having troubles with your weight or your body mass index is climbing and your doctor is suggesting that you're going to be at risk for developing diabetes unless you get that down, then maybe a health coach through BC Self Management might be a way to say, this is my goal, I need to be able to eat better. And we need to, I guess, ensure that we are eating foods that are lower on the glycemic index. If that is a concern. And yeah. overall, because carbohydrates are so rich in calories, mm -hmm. we tend to eat more of it, and we're evolutionarily geared to reach for the sweets, reach for mm -hmm. the simple carbohydrates, because they give us the energy to go out and fight bears and tigers. Yeah. But we don't have to do that, and so maybe we don't need quite so much. So reducing that and trying to make it the rougher, the higher fiber, the lower glycemic index carbohydrates, it is better for you, better for your digestion. Increasing fiber in your diet is very helpful. You also talked about remaining socially active. And in the frailty program, I, I, I go, okay, why is that so important? And let's say you've started to become a little bit more reclusive. How do you turn that around? So being socially active means talking to people. It could be your family to start with. Um, but you need more than that. You need to get out, engage with the community. So in our program, we really reach out to resources in the community, and that is one of the um, assets that a senior can have to decrease the chance of frailty development, mm -hmm. is to reach out to organizations like church groups, um, book clubs, weaving clubs, quilting clubs, whatever, where you're sharing a common interest, enjoying the company of others, 
and then just engaging in that intellectual discussions and exchange of ideas, which is really helpful for maintenance of brain function. So helping people to do that, is that one of the components of the frailty project that you're pioneering yes, at this point? Yes, yes. Yeah. So if I have a patient who is really isolated, living in a condominium, never gets out except maybe to go to her grocery store, um, we might pose as a goal for her, okay, so I'm going to have you increase your activity, but maybe let's increase your activity where you're actually getting to a community center. Mm -hmm. So a goal for this month may be go to the community center and you can break that down so that you have really small goals to achieve with your coach. So first week is just making it out the door even. So mm -hmm. make those goals achievable and very specific and that's how you're going to achieve that in the end. And then the long-term goal being you get to the community center, look at what activities there are on the bulletin board and see if you can find one that you like and find one that's doable for that senior. And that is reaching out into the community, increasing socialization, and chances are it will be a physically um, more active And endeavor. the person who's phoning saying, how's it going, is also going to Check encourage in on them that. to, yes. it, like, did you make that contact, did yes. you go? Yeah, which is important. Yes. How does somebody get involved in this program if they're watching this saying, hey, I want to be a part of that? So currently mm -hmm. our pre-frailty program is just uh, launching in the Fraser Valley. We want to take it across the lower mainland, we want to take it across the province, and we're starting to talk about sort of national networks across the country to make it a national collaborative. But BC Self-Management Coaching Program is already in place in BC, uh, run by uh, University of Victoria, and it is free. So they can just go online and look up BC Self-Management and either sign up to become a coach themselves, which is also very helpful for the coach, or else sign up to get a coach and you can talk to your family doctor um, about getting a coach and they can in investigate this with you and develop a wellness plan based on their knowledge of your situation. What's the number one thing that you would want somebody to take away from this conversation? Take charge of your health early, a plan for your next 10 years, 20 years of life and make sure that you have a habit that's going to encourage a healthy and independent senior years as you get older. Thank you very much. And You're very may we welcome. all age well. You and me both. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.